What up YouTube, this is Echo Grande representing here. Got a bit of a rough one today, so uh, let's talk about the latest Game of Thrones episode. So we're in Bravos watching the play once again, and actress Cersei, aka Lady Crane, is giving her speech after Joffrey's poisoning. Having taken Arya's advice, she actually gives a much more powerful monologue this time that actually drives the audience to tears. She goes backstage to drink her rum, classic alcoholic, and she hears a noise. She pulls back a curtain and finds Arya looking, uh... I don't know. A little different. A lot more paler than usual, but hey, put her under the sun for a little bit and she'll be golden. Oh yeah, that's right, remember all those theories about how it wasn't actually Arya, it was supposed to be Jack in a disguise, or the wife is like her second personality? Turns out you can throw all those out the window because it actually was Arya, she actually was that stupid and let the wife stab her. Crane takes Arya back to her place and mends her wounds. She sees Arya for who she truly is and asks her to come with her. Arya refuses, giving an interesting speech on how she believes there's more to the world than Westeros and Essos. First time I think in the series it's actually been proposed that there's more to the world than Westeros and Essos. Is she being serious? Is she being whimsical? I don't know. It was a weird moment. Cut to an eerie looking forest where several gentlemen are chatting around a fire, when a mysterious figure with an axe starts to approach them. The weary traveler requests a seat by the fire. Nope, uh-uh, it's the hound. He lobs off the head of the first one, cuts the throat of another one, disembowels a third, leaving him wailing as his insides pour out of his gut. Leaves the fourth one barely alive to interrogate him, but he ain't having that. The hound, like a badass, slices him in half. Vertically. Gosh darn it, I told myself I wouldn't do it and I did it anyway. Believe me, you guys are in for some major disappointment in just a second. In Marine, Tyrion and Barriss are walking through the streets. Tyrion, looking like he just got back from Lord of the Rings convention cosplaying as Frodo, turns out Varys is going back to Westeros to seek more support and ships. Hmm, who do we know in this series that just stole a bunch of ships and one of them is missing his dick? Tyrion, you're becoming less and less like the political genius that we came to know and love in Season 2. In King's Landing, Cersei is summoned by Lancel to visit the High Sparrow. Cersei refuses and things get ugly real fast. Cue Cersei's trademark line from every single trailer that promoted Season 6, as Robert Strong does the unspeakable to one of the Faith Militant soldiers. But do we get to see it? No. Instead we get to see Kyburn having an orgasm in the background as his creation shows off his awesome power. Thankfully, Kyburn's little hard-on is upstaged by Cersei trying to intimidate Lancel. In the Riverlands, Brienne goes to reunite with Jaime. While they talk, Padre catches up with Bronn, who's as trolly as ever with the poor squire. And Bronn, of course, proposes that Brienne and Jaime are sexually interested in each other. Hey, congratulations, Bronn! You just became the first fanfiction shipper in Game of Thrones. Why is that a good thing? In the tents, Brienne is requesting counsel with the Blackfish, as she's been ordered by Sansa to gather the Tully army for Jon's assault on Winterfell. Jaime allows Brienne to discuss the Tully surrender, as long as Jaime promises he'll let them go free and head north. She actually tries to give Oathbreaker back to Jamie, looking like my ex-girlfriend trying to give back one of my hoodies. Jamie refuses to take Oathkeeper back and the sexual tension just rises when Brienne admits how if it comes out to a fight she'll have to fight on the Tully side. She's allowed entry to the castle, but the Blackfish refuses to listen to her until she gives him Sansa's orders. As the Blackfish reads the letter, he references Sansa's mother, Catelyn Stark, but things don't go Brienne's way and the Blackfish still refuses. So what the hell, guys? The conflict is serious enough in this show. We don't need everybody saying no to helping Jon and Sansa take back Winterfell. We already saw this crap like four times last week. Lyanna's 62 men better be worth the trouble in the screen time. Back in King's Landing, Cersei enters the throne room. Cue the cringiest scene I ever saw in Game of Thrones as Cersei squares off against Kevin Lannister. Kevin, baby, listen. If you want to intimidate your niece and boss her around, you cannot be sounding like an Imperial officer straight out of Star Wars. I know Game of Thrones is up to cheese level, but that was some Brie Gorgonzola right there. Tommen makes an announcement about Cersei and Loras Tyrell's trial by combat. Tommen announces that trials by combat are now banned by the faith. They did it! They actually did it! They crushed one of the biggest theories in Game of Thrones history. I didn't think I'd hate Tommen more than Joffrey, but they actually pulled it off! Okay, okay, okay. 
Granted, that probably didn't mean anything, we still have a couple more episodes left. Not to mention Cersei has a little wildfire in her eyes, you know what I'm saying? But I'll admit, if Tommen's not dead with his tongue hanging out of his throat by the end of the season finale, torches and pitchforks available on GameOfThronesSucks.com. Back in Marines, Tyrion is continuing his failure streak when he attempts another icebreaker with Missandei and Grey Worm. The recycling is strong once again with this scene when Tyrion comically fails again. I'll let this one slide though, because it's Tyrion. <laughs> Tyrion, I thought you were smarter than your father, not dumber. The fun's cut short when the alarm bells start going off. Over a hundred ships are in the harbor, and it turns out the slavers are back for their property. Looks like we're in for a bit of an epic tease battle before the Bastard Bowl, but I doubt we're gonna see any more of this till next year. Back in the Riverlands, Jamie powwows with an imprisoned Edmir Tully. Edmir chastises the Kingslayer on his little battle against the Blackfish, and lectures him a little bit on decency. The best acting I've seen so far from Edmir Tully. It's actually pretty refreshing. Jamie throws back to his imprisonment by Catelyn's Stark, another Catelyn reference in this episode, and wonder what that could mean. The scene doesn't really bring much to the table, but I will admit it made me like Jamie a lot less. Okay, watch this. This is a summary of this five minute scene in five seconds. You ready? I don't want to be here. I just want to have sex with my sister. A very tense scene ensues when Edmir is allowed into the castle. The phrase, having no idea what Jamie is up to, thinks that he just gave away their strongest leverage. All is not as it seems when Edmir Tully orders the surrender of the Tully army and demands that the Blackfish be arrested. So, Edmir's on Jamie's and the phrase side now? Deep in the caves beneath the castle, Brienne has been hiding to help the Blackfish escape. But he refuses as soon as Brienne asks him to come with them. Acting a little more selfish than usual because he wants to stay and defend his ancestral home. You know, the home that he's only going to be alive three more years to be in instead of, I don't know, helping his niece who's just now starting her life to take back her ancestral home. And that's not the only middle finger in the scene. We don't even see the Blackfish fight! Jamie's just up on the walls and a Frey soldier goes up to him and tells him that the Blackfish is dead. First dumbass Arya, then no Clegane Bowl, and now we don't see the Blackfish fight to his death. Game of Thrones, you're starting to lose me. Cut back to Marine, which is in a state of chaos and fire. What? An actual battle? I thought that was Game of Thrones and I was supposed to get tasered for this The group is held up in a council chamber and Grey Worm rightly so chastises Tyrion for his diplomacy attempts. Pretty much representing the audience on why he's starting to suck at it. Then they hear a pounding on the roof that shakes the entire room. And poof, Danny comes marching in like she's only been gone a couple hours for groceries. Hey Drogon, what are you flying away for buddy? Cities in flames in case you didn't notice. Uh, okay, just keep going. You gonna be back to help Danny invade Westeros in season 100? Back to the Hound, he finds the Brotherhood that attacked his set. With all the Catelyn Stark references, I'm sure we're in for something good. Nope, it's just Beric Dondarrion and Thoris of Mir. They're about to hang the treasonous Brotherhood, and the Hound gets really all cutesy trying to negotiate being allowed to kill some of them. All three end up getting hanged, and the Hound chills with the Brotherhood for a while. Good to know the Brotherhood are still good guys, or what is considered a good guy in Game of Thrones. Beric asks the Hound to join them, and the Hound actually considers his offer. Cut all the way back to Arya, who's still sleeping. She's roughly woken up by a loud thud. She finds Lady Crane dead, and apparently she suffered greatly in her death. The wife shows up and a chase ensues. Granted the chase was a little boring, but I was glad it expanded out so long, because we got to see a really good look at Bravos and for what it really is. Seems every time we cut to Bravos, it's always just in one location or a bird's eye view of the city. Even though it looks like Arya is about to leave, I hope we see more of Bravos in the future. By the end of the chase, the wife has Arya pinned in a dark corridor, assumably her first living quarters after she left the Faceless Men. And in a throwback, if you remember, remember when Arya initially left the Faceless Man, she was in this little place with just a candle and she blows it out, leaving her in pure darkness. Here with Arya pinned against the wife, the candle is the only source of light once again, and Arya with one swift cut of needle blows the candle out, echoing back to her training days when she was blind. That's actually pretty genius. Of course, that means another epic character fight that we're not gonna see. Back in the House of Black and White, Jacken stumbles across a face on the wall. Not of Arya's face, but the wife. Arya shows up and Jacken gives her a GG well played, but Arya refuses to give away her identity and announces that she's returning home. Jacken smirks as she walks away, still having some respect for her. Your love didn't work for her yet. While I'm a bit saddened that the decent character Lady Crane had to die and we didn't see Arya become a fully fledged badass assassin, I'm still glad for how her development turned out. Sure, her training stretched out a little in the conflict was just pure filler, but it still seemed to pay off. For the longest time, especially during her time with the Hound, Arya wanted nothing to do with her family, and that's when she truly wanted to be no one. By then she was willing to give up her identity to become a killer. And that's when the true character development came into play, when she goes to the Faceless Men. She could never learn that becoming a nameless assassin meant giving up your 
identity and sweeping all your vengeance quarrels under the rug. Really wish it didn't take as long for her to learn it, but at least it paid off. Sucks we couldn't see her fight with the wife, but the concept of Arya going back to her training days when she was blind was actually a pretty nice touch. And as for that little Tommen moment where he says no trials by combat, everybody just calm down, we still have a couple more episodes, Bastard Bowl is next week, and who knows what's gonna happen in season finale. The setup for King's Landing could go anywhere even though I know it's going to culminate in Cersei burning the city down with wildfire. Granted, the Hound looks like he's stuck with the Brotherhood. That'll become its own thing, probably. But as long as the Hound is still alive, we'll have plenty of gratuitous action. Speaking of action, looks like next week is going to be focused solely on the battle for Winterfell. Will Ramsay get his well-earned comeuppance? Will Jon and Sansa come out on top? I'm not going to lie. I'm more hyped for Lyanna's 62 men getting into action than this imaginary Clegane Bowl. If her men are as badass as Lyanna is fierce, the next week is going to be good. I know you're psyched. I'm sure as Hell excited. Hopefully even though the episode is going to take place in just one spot, I'm sure there'll be plenty more to talk about for a full-fledged review. And if so, you can bet your bottom dollars I'm going to be talking about it. This has been another Echo Review. Cheers everyone, thanks for watching. My name is Matt and I am signing out.